Tina Kotu, Tina Tato Katoa. Welcome to the Auckland Unitarian Church, a place that has been home to people like us for 117 years. And like many other churches, it doesn't have a creed. Instead, it has shared principles, such as the goal of world community, with peace, liberty, and justice for all, and respect for the independent web of all existence, of which we are a part. Those two goals will feature in our service this morning, and I hope they will do something that be something that we can study and share together. We also hope that you will share us with us in a cup of tea or coffee after the service and feel that you are welcome. The opening words that I would like to use today are from David Attenborough, who was speaking to a climate conference in Poland a while ago, a few couple of days ago, uh, and he said that the um, climate change, if it is not addressed more seriously, uh, will lead to the um, end of our civilizations. Um, scary words. I would have got some more from you, uh, more of him, but unfortunately, um, I, was, I tried to copy a piece off the, um, the news feed, and all the news feeds are full of photos. Now that would have ended up with about ten pages, <laughs> of which I only wanted to use a couple of phrases. At times, our light goes out and is kindled by a spark from someone else. Each of us has cause to think with gratitude of other people who have relit the flame within us. My message today is three things that I didn't realise about global warming. I learned about these three things at a Sea of Faith conference a couple of months ago and they were presented by an engineer, Jeff Henderson. And um, I'd heard all sorts of viewpoints on global warming before, as, as we all have, but I'd never heard one from an engineer's point of view. And I think that's what made it uh, so helpful to me. He helped me understand some of the mechanisms that cause global warming and what we can do about it. He said there were three uh, reasons we need to, to know. Uh, we need to know uh, what is the sequence of events that leads to global warming, um, and that was the first point that he dealt with. I must say, I had wondered, although I agree that global warming is a problem, uh, it puzzled me why they were always talking about very small increases uh, of temperature, like half a degree of temperature. And I wondered how on earth the, the um, earth getting half a degree different could make, cause such harm. Well, he gave the figures for this. Um, in the first quarter of the 19th century, the average surface temperature of the Earth was 13.6 degrees. In the next 25 years, it rose to 13.7 degrees. In the third quarter of the 19th century, it rose to 13.9 degrees. And in the final quarter, it rose to 14.2. Now that is only half a degree of temperature rise in 100 years. So where is the problem? And then he did a projection of the likely temperature rise in the next, in the 100 years that we're now 18 years into. And in the first quarter, it is expected to rise from 14.2 up to 14.5. And from then to 2050, it's expected to rise up to 14.6 degrees. And in the third quarter, it'll go to 14.7. And by the year 2100, uh, it will rise to 14.8%. In other words, it will only have risen a third of a degree in the last 100 years. How can that be a problem? And he gave a, a solution which opened my eyes to what's going on. He said the problem is isothermal warming. Isothermal means the temperature stays the same, but the heat is going somewhere else. And he gave an illustration. Um, 
If you heat a saucepan of water, it rises up to 100 degrees, and if you keep on heating it, it still stays at 100 degrees. Where does all the extra heat go? Well, it's turning the water into steam, and it's such an even process that we use this to keep the water temperature constant while we boil an egg. Boiling water doesn't change its temperature. Another isothermal process is when water starts turning to ice. Um, you can keep on taking energy out of the water, but once it gets down to, I think it's minus four degrees, I'm not sure the exact figure, um, it doesn't get any colder. Um, the water keeps on instead turning to more and more ice because all the energy is being taken out of the ice and the temperature is hardly changing at all. So he said, with the atmosphere, the reason why it doesn't get much warmer is because all that extra energy is going out of the surface into the sea. And so the sea is doing the warming, but equally the sea does not um, heat up that much because all its extra energy is coming out of the ice at the, um, at the North and South Poles. And that um, we have seen happening because the ice uh, around the North Pole has been, uh, sea ice has been melting, and now the land ice is starting to, um, to melt as well. And, but still, what was it likely to do um, in the 19th century? Well, it says in the 19th century, the sea level rose two centimetres, which again you would hardly notice. And since then, it has risen 20 centimetres um, in, in the 20th century. And again, you might notice that if you had um, um, some building right on the water's edge, but 20, 20 centimetres, the um, tide goes up and down many times that size every day without causing mayhem. And, but um, uh, I, I use my own illustration of, of it. Um, if, the, uh, if you put the um, ice in a saucepan and melt it, um, nothing happens till it's suddenly all water, eventually all water. If you um, keep heating the water, it gradually turns all into steam. Once, this, once all the water has turned to steam, you're going to melt your frying pan. It's going to be an incredibly rapid, incredibly da disastrous result. In the same way, once the ice from the poles has, has all uh, turned to water, the sea level could rise as much as uh, th three metres between now and the end of the year. But that's only an estimate. Um, um, if there's a slight tweaking of the results, it could rise 50 metres. And in 50 metre rise, um, very, uh, all the coastal cities in the world would be underwater. And already some are starting to go through that fate. Some island countries are starting to disappear out of the Pacific. And so that was the, um, the scary illustration which made me see it in, um, in a new light. His second fact I found a little harder to follow. He says it's the logic of action. He said there is uncertainty in all of these numbers, especially when you look at the future. We can't guarantee that it's going to be half a degree, it might be a degree. We can't be sure uh, how rapidly the ice will melt because the ice is in lots of different places, some of it on, on land and some of it on sea. But there, however fast or slow it is, there are four stages. The first stage is a small, a small temperature rise starts the process. The second stage, only floating ice would melt while the ocean and sea temperature would hardly change. In the third stage, land-based ice would also melt. The temperature would hardly change, but the sea level will rise. But the worst stage is stage four. When all the ice is gone, suddenly everything will heat up dramatically and you cannot predict exactly when. And so his second argument was, we have to put estimates on these numbers. We have to say, what is, uh, we, we figure that the temperature rise is going to be so much. What if we were 30% out on our estimate? So we've got, you can't just say global warming is, uh, is unpredictable, so we should do nothing. You've got to put numbers on those. You've got to say, we estimate that stage two is going to happen 
in this fast, that stage three will happen this fast, and we've got to um, take a best, um, a best knowledge uh, guesstimate of when those various disasters are going to happen and start planning them now. At the very least, we need to stop the carbon dioxide from, from which is um, warming up the atmosphere and making all this happen. So, on the bright side of it, he said um, some of the some of the um, factors for um, for curing global warming are already known. We already know um, that um, planting trees will reduce the carbon dioxide in the air. We don't need any new technology to do that. We already have many um, petrol-free ways of generating energy. Solar energy is quite well known. It is growing quite rapidly as people start to see. Um, um, so, so why is it asked, his third question is why, if we know the answer to the problem, um, why don't we do it? And he says the answer is an economic one. The answer is that it's um, the use of petrol um, and other uses of um, non-renewable energy um, are, are we, we keep doing them because they're cheaper. Um, and the answer, he says, is for the government to, to make those things so they're not cheaper so that the people who cause the pollution um, uh, pay for the damage. And I must admit, I was uh, caught in one such example myself uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, my wife and I were concerned about global warming. We decided that our next car would be a, um, um, would be a hybrid car um, so it uses way less, it uses um, about 40% less petrol. Um, we would have got a, um, a, a, that cost us, uh, it's about $1,000 dearer than a petrol driven car, so that's no big deal for us to pay another $1,000 uh, because it would save that in petrol in a year or two. Um, but why didn't we take go the whole hog and get an electric car uh, that's all electric? Uh, our one uses petrol and, um, and it compensates for that by generating electricity and it's going downhill. Um, so it's, it's much more efficient, but why not go the whole hog and get one that's, um, um, that's totally electric driven? And the answer is, is that one, that kind of car is about $10,000 dearer. Um, <laughs> and that was uh, our, our sense of um, concern for global warming sort of drew the line at that, and that's why we've got a, um, uh, a hybrid car. And somebody pointed out to us the other day that um, in a few years, bat um, batteries will become cheaper, the all-electric cars will become cheaper, and um, our car will be redundant. <laughs> we we'll wonder why the heck we are. Um, but, it, but see, the government could, governments could change that by subsidising. They could subsidise the all-electric cars uh, so that people could afford them and so that um, the economics would push us that much faster. So those are the conclusions I got from, from his, his address. I'm sure on the third stage of what we should do about it, most of you would know the answers. Um, we can all take steps like this. Um, there's a, a fourth step that I add myself. Um, when, the, uh, when I went to the Sea of Faith conference, um, all the Auckland members um, who went down there, this was in Wellington, uh, we were each given one of the speakers to speak about. And um, I, was, I got the job of speaking about this uh, global warming, this engineer's approach. And after I gave my summary, um, another member of the Sea of Faith got up, he was a theologian. He says he doesn't think we should be um, talking about um, issues like climate change, which our job is um, to speak about religion, and um, global warming is not part of religion, so we shouldn't be talking about it. And I... Um, I, I had the opposite view because this was in preparation for annual meeting. We were going to pick our subjects for next year, um, our CFA topics. And I'd be planning to get up and say, I think we should have more scientific um, speeches and less about religion. <laughs> and uh, at least I said it's a compromise. But I thought, why is it that religious people uh, want to keep their religious knowledge in an in isolated way? And I think it's because we have too narrow a view of what religion is. I think religion can can cover anything that, ex that, that deals with human values, anything that deals with human welfare, anything that deals with responsible living. All those things uh, should be part of our agenda, whatever our religion, 
and to try and keep religion to the things that, that it did hundreds of years ago is to make it um, year by year more and more irrelevant. So um, I commend that to you that our, as a church, um, um, I, don't mean, I don't think many Unitarians would think what that theologian thought, but in the case you do, um, I'd say that's the fourth thing we can do. Churches um, and other pressure groups can become educated on the scientific and other issues, and by doing that, uh, we are helping to address the problems of global warming. For our meditation, I, I suggest we spend a few minutes um, thinking, each of us on our own, the things that we appreciate about the world, the world, the world of nature, as it is and as it could be. for my closing words, may love inspire you, wisdom guide you, and peace surround you until we meet again.